Thanks very much indeed. The simple question we've got today is, what are you? Now, I think most of the time, the common sense view we have is that we, each of us, is an individual with some essence, some core, which remains the same throughout our life. It defines us. But if you actually think about what we are, well, actually, you start thinking about the things that are going on in our head, such as our memories and so forth. We normally say, I have a memory. But if you think about it, take away your memories, what happens to you? If you lost all your memories right now, would that be you less your memories, or would you not be there? Beliefs, another kind of thing as well. I say I have beliefs. If you woke up tomorrow, though, without all your beliefs completely transformed, what of you would remain? Wouldn't you be changed? Uh, that's a desire, actually. Before. This is a belief. This person either believes they are the Messiah or in the Messiah. I'm not sure. <laughs> Whatever it is. And there's also, of course, our knowledge. So if you think about it, we have all these different things in our heads, which we say we have. But the point is that if you imagine those things just being transformed, all those psychological things transformed, then what would happen? So maybe, actually, it's those things which are the key thing. Maybe we're wrong to think that at the heart of them, there is a you at all. Could it just be that, in fact, there are thoughts, there are memories, there are intentions, and there are desires, and that these are the things that not only define you, but make you? And the reason there is a you there is simply because these things are very closely related and connected. There is what some philosophers have called psychological connectedness and continuity. And it's this network of things which makes you, you. That is you. Rather than there being some you, an essence of you at your core, which has these things. Now, some people find this a freaky idea, and I don't know why they do. Because if you think about everything else in the universe, it's like that. Now, you've done a bit of basic chemistry. No one thinks there is a thing called water which has two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom attached to it. When we say water is H2O, what we simply mean is there is nothing more than the parts which make up uh, the water. Why should we be any different? Why do we think that we are things which have thoughts, memories, and intentions? Why don't we think we're just an ordered collection of such things? This may seem low, not enough. I mean, but if this is just a simple uh, analogy here. You can get an image. You can make an image made of simple squares, dots, and so forth. And just by an arrangement, you get a distinct, unique individual. Change just 10% of those, and you can get a completely different picture. If simply by changing an arrangement of parts like this, you can get a completely different picture, imagine what happens if you change the billions of parts which go up in a human brain. And really, what is the alternative? Because if you think there is a little core pearl inside of you, it's like this. It's like there's a little you inside your head. And of course, the problem there is what's inside of the little head inside the little head, and so forth. Now, this view I'm giving isn't original. I wish it was. It actually has a great pedigree. It's actually a similar view to the one propounded by the Buddha, the Anatta view, or no-self view. It's also a view that we see coming up in Enlightenment philosophy, David Hume. For example, David Hume, uh, because of a, a word Hume just used once, in which he described the self as the bundle uh, it's often called the bundled view of the self. We are simply an arrangement of the different elements which make up our consciousness. And it's also the view that you really see most, virtually every neuroscientist, this is Paul Brox at Plymouth, um, agreeing on as well. And certainly neurologically, it's the case. There is no like part of the brain where it all comes together. We seem to be just emergent from that. So the question is then... If we are this bundle, does that mean we're just illusions? Some people use the word illusion. Psychologist Susan Blackmore does, because she says an illusion is something that is not what it appears to be. We appear to be something enduring and we're not. But I think that's wrong. Is this an illusion? A chariot, right? A chariot is nothing more than an assemblage of its parts, right? There is no thing which is a chariot separate from the parts. Does that mean it's an illusion? No, it just means that's what a chariot is. Why should we be different? And perhaps a better analogy for us is one used by the neuroscientist Michael Gazzaniga, which is of an organ. An organ, again, it's not an illusion, even though it's only basically an assemblage of parts. And Gazzaniga says, you know, that's kind of what explains us. The thousands or millions of conscious moments that we each have 
reflects one of our networks being up for duty. These are in our brain. When one finishes, the next one pops up. The pipe organ-like device plays its tune all days long. And it's because we have so many tunes in our fingertips, in our brain, that we can be the distinct and unique and individual wonderful creatures we are. And that you are. Thank you. Thank you.